So my name is Edward Miro. I am here to do a speaker introduction, but before that, I just want to give a shout out to some of our sponsors, uh, MongoDB, Microsoft, Verizon, Salesforce, uh, Amazon Information Security, eLearn Security, Intel, and Remediant. Uh, thank you so much to all of the amazing sponsors and to all the attendees who are here. This is an awesome event, and I'm so proud to be one of the volunteers for that. Uh, also, I just want to remind you that there is a career village going on. Uh, there is a capture the flag, and uh, yeah, uh, try to get involved. There's a badge workshop. You can learn to solder. There's so much going on, so uh, definitely check that stuff out while you're here. And next up, I have the honor of introducing Carlota Sage. Um, they're going to be doing a talk uh, called uh, Stage 1 Low Tech and Insecure, Building Better Boundaries at Work and in Life. Um, if you have any questions, there may be time at the end for Q&A, but if not, we're going to move it over to the Career Village. Uh, thank you, Carlota, and uh, take it away. Thank you so much. I appreciate that word. Uh, yes, this is low tech and insecure. Just to be very clear, this is not a technical talk. This is not your entry level physical penetration uh, talk. This is not an HR talk either. And it's not even a soft skills talk. This is a life skills talk. And it's about building uh, confidence through boundaries. I am Carlota Sage. I have worked at a lot of Silicon Valley uh, tech companies. I have when I've gone to a lot of different colleges and universities. Uh, and I want to, to give a little aside to our hiring managers out there and remind them that the Carlota Sage that dropped out of Auburn University had the exact same potential as the Carlota Sage that graduated from Columbia University with her master's. I just didn't have the experience or the guidance to know what I wanted. So hiring managers, please don't let the lack of a degree keep you from hiring a really fantastic person. I've been very lucky in my career in that regard. But enough about me. I want to talk about confidence. What is your confidence level? And the reason I ask this question is that over the last 10 years, I've had a lot of younger women and men come up to me and ask me to be their mentor. And at first, I was a little horrified <laughs> because I am not historically someone that I would have gone to for mentoring. Uh, but as I asked them, what is it that you're looking for that you feel like Carlota can teach you? A lot of what came back was, I, I just, you're so confident. And I, I just feel like I, I'm an imposter all the time. There was a lot of talk around imposter syndrome. I do not personally suffer from imposter syndrome. So I cannot guarantee that the talk that I give you is going to, going to help you understand or resolve your imposter syndrome. But what I can tell you is that my confidence comes from knowing my boundaries really, really well. Uh, we don't all as human beings start out on the right side of this image, that very confident, you know, ready to face the world. Um, I tend to be on that right side, maybe between those two right hand figures. Sometimes the world pushes me down to the left. Sometimes, you know, I, I need an uh, extra hand to help me get back to the right. Uh, most of us are somewhere in between. Hopefully, uh, you are not on the left. But what I want to, to help you understand is that building your confidence is something that you can do. And you may have to engage a mental health professional, a career coach, a life coach. But you know, you need to take ownership of that. If you feel like you are an imposter, don't feel that way. You've got to find a way past that and you can learn that piece. So what I'm gonna give you today is Carlota's crash course on finding your boundaries so that you can start to understand where you are on this image and where you want to be and how to maybe start practicing some of those pieces that will build your confidence. Uh, I'm going to start with physical boundaries because those are some very obvious, very common, uh, especially egregious places to push on people's boundaries. And as uh, many people in this audience know, both female and male and other identifying uh, non-binary folks, um, the physical boundaries are so important. And sometimes that you you get that hand on your knee, you get that hand in a strange place, you're not comfortable, but you're not necessarily comfortable saying something. I want you to start practicing where your boundaries are physically, and I want you to start practicing defending them because it's very important. People who push on your boundaries, especially abusers, are going to start very small. 
And you have to defend those small boundaries so that by the time that they're trying to push on those bigger boundaries, uh, you've got those defenses built up. So if you find that hand on your knee or sliding down your skirt or up your leg, you need to be very clear. And you don't have to be angry about it. I used to be very angry about it. I'm very much more uh, uh, just simply certain about it now. But you need to be very clear. Remove your hand from my body. You do not have consent to touch me. It's very simple. And I talk about this because, especially at conferences, uh, we get a little loose, we get a little, we get to cut up, we get people who are of our mindset, we get our tribe, we get a little alcohol in us. Um, and we may, we may also push on those boundaries. So I, I put this image up so that people can understand and have kind of a level set that this is not okay. And they can point back and say, you know, Carlotta said it's not okay. <laughs> it, it's a really basic thing. And when it comes to defending your physical boundaries, don't be shy about that. It is not a request. You do not have to say, please, this is your space. Remove your hand from my body. And it's very simple. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about verbal boundaries. And this is a much more difficult space to talk about because words can literally kill. We hear stories, see stories all the time about cyberbullying, cyberstalking, and uh, people literally beating other people down with words and telling them that they're worthless, telling them that they should die. It is not okay. Um, even in the workplace, even if we're not going to that extreme, Choose your words well, choose your words thoughtfully, because the words that you choose build people's confidence in you. They build your own confidence as well, but they also build the people's confidence in you. Uh, they build your credibility. They build your ability to work in very difficult situations. Um, I'm very good with collaboration. I've made a lot of my career around getting technical teams who are antagonistic to work together. Um, and part of that is the word selection. Uh, I will give you a very personal example from my own life, my own career. I worked for a, a heavily Asian company and I had an older gentleman for a boss, an older gentleman from Hong Kong, and he would call me girl. And that did not bother me because I knew that he was not saying it in any malicious kind of way. That was just the era he came from. Um, but the younger men started picking it up and the way they said it was not okay. They would say it very derisively, very kind of viciously. Uh, so the next time the boss called me girl, and in front of the rest of the team, I, I called him on it and I very gently, well, not very gently, very uh, assertively said, you may call me woman or you may call me the B word, but you are not allowed to call me girl anymore. And when he kind of paused, I said, I want you to say in your native language, uh, which I believe was either Mandarin or Cantonese, I'm not sure because he came from Hong Kong. Uh, I want you to say what you just said to me, and I want you to use girl in your language. And he said it out loud, and the look on his face of just regret. He said, oh, Carlotta, I'm so very sorry. I will never call you girl again. So it, it matters. It matters how people in the workplace refer to you. And it's okay to push back on that. And it's okay sometimes with some bosses, with that boss for certain, um, it's okay to push back on, on them in front of other people, especially if you can give them you know, that empathy, if you know that you can get them to come to an empathetic place with you. Uh, I hope that you will still make room for people for whom English is not their first language. I make a lot of room for older generations because uh, generations older than me did not have the internet. We are much more aware and the generations that came after me are incredibly aware. Uh, I, I, I know there's a lot of discussion on, do we have to change safe uh, whitelist, blacklist to safe list, except for example. Language has always evolved and it evolves without us. So the fact that we're taking some ownership of that evolution, I see as a very good thing. Uh, in terms of boundaries though, you have to work that one out. This one is a little softer, a little harder to, to define. You definitely wanna to talk to your peers and get their feedback, 
Um, listen to the people you trust. If they say, no, that's not okay for them to talk to you that way. Uh, figure out where your confidence level is and confronting that. That's a very tough boundary sometimes to defend. But unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to keep going into that. The next boundary that I want to cover, though, are your emotional boundaries. And these are by far and away the, the most difficult. Um, you think words are, are tough. Emotions are very tough. The thing I want you to remember about emotions, when you have that emotional response to a situation or to something someone has said to you, you need to understand that that is your emotion and it is not right or wrong. It doesn't matter if the other person understands it or agrees with it or finds that emotion reasonable. You need to own that this is how I feel about this. I'm afraid of dogs. That is the way I feel about that. Bringing me a dog is not gonna make me feel better, right? Um, that's just one example. The other person though needs to understand that they cannot fix that emotional response and they cannot bend that emotional response to me be more favorable for them. You need to own, this is how I feel about this. You need to ask for more time. And it could be that you do have some very tight emotional boundaries there that need to be maybe a little more flexible. The other thing about emotional and, and really all boundaries is that they are flexible. They are flexible for certain people or for certain situations. You're going to be more comfortable or less comfortable with your family, depending on how you grew up. You're going to be more comfortable with your friends than with strangers. Um, the biggest thing is that you own that. And then you think about if, if somebody you really trust is surprised by your emotional boundary, then, then maybe there's a discussion there that you need to understand where that feeling is coming from and then resolve that conflict. Because if it's someone you really trust, you really want their input. The problem, of course, is if you really trust an abusive person, that's also an issue that can really, really mess with your emotional boundaries. But we're going to get to that in just a little bit. Uh, the, the biggest topic that I want to talk about are the more sensitive things, intimacy, romance, sex in the workplace and in industry conferences. Um, we spend a lot of time with the people we work with and in security, especially sometimes that's a, a crucible and that pressure can actually forge a very close relationship. Uh, if you are interested, if you feel like there is something beyond a work relationship, there, you need to be very careful about how you approach that. The simplest thing to do is to say, don't. <laughs> if you are interested in a coworker or in a, a, an industry peer, if you feel like that spark is there, be very careful. Be very careful about revealing that because it will change the dynamic of your relationship. But the reality is, we're human and we're not mannequins and we do have those feelings. And sometimes we trust the other person enough and, and you really want to think about if you trust that other person enough, maybe you trust that other person enough to, to see if there is more available there and you have to be very careful on how you approach that. The best way is not to stick your hand down their pants. It is not to suddenly lean over and kiss them. Um, some people respond positively to that, but it's not going to be very common. The best way to approach that is to ask for consent and to say, uh, I feel like there's something more here. Is there the potential for that? Am I, is this a one-sided feeling? And you need to be very ready for rejection for that. Uh, if you are the target of somebody else's affection, you need to be very certain when you re reject that person. Um, don't, don't maybe them if it's a no. It's not be very clear, draw that boundary very firmly that there is not something more, more available here. If that changes, now it's your turn to ask consent. Uh, if, you know how you, you a few months ago asked me if there was more here. And at the time I said no, but as I've gotten to know you, I think there could be more here. Are you still interested? Maybe they've met someone, maybe they've moved on. 
it, be very careful how you approach those. The easiest thing is always going to be to hold that feeling to yourself and let it pass, let that crush go by. Um, but if you are a risk taker, you have to think very carefully on how to approach that and the consequences of that. Because whether that becomes a relationship, whether that relationship is successful or goes sideways, there is a risk to your credibility and to the person's credibility that you need to be very cognizant of, uh, especially if it's a very small workplace, it's very clear that you two are cozy, that can have some serious ramifications. So you need to be very careful how you approach those pieces. Uh, sometimes though, <laughs> people particularly of a certain gender tend to send pictures of their genitalia. And that's fine if you've asked for it. If you have not, then you can send this back to them, right? You should not be starting your workplace romance with a dick pic, ideally. Um, I've had more than my share fair, uh, fair share, as I'm sure many women and, and transgender, uh, maybe even men are getting them from, not just men, but from women. Uh, Sending an intimate photo of any of any sort, especially to a coworker, is a very bad idea. So you need to make sure that you have very specific permission to do that. But you also need to really trust that person if you're going to do that. It is once it's out there, it's out there. I re recommend highly never doing it. If you are the recipient of an unsolicited picture, you are welcome to screenshot this and crop it and send it back to that person so that they know this is not acceptable behavior. Uh, never, ever, ever do anything of a remotely sexual nature with a peer uh, or a manager or a sub or a, a, somebody who re reports to you. Never do that without treading very carefully and asking for consent. Um, and even then, again, that default state of just no is really important. So now that I've given you a bit of a crash course on what kinds of boundaries are out there and, and just a few tips on how you can handle those boundaries, I wanna talk about how pushing boundaries becomes abuse. And we talked about this, I alluded to this in that, that initial slide with our mannequins. Um, pushing boundaries can be a very good thing. They can break you out of your comfort zone and force you to grow. And some of us like to leap out of our, our comfort zone and, and force ourselves to grow. Um, but pushing boundaries repeatedly to the point where you have to ask a person to stop, that's a little less good, but that's not necessarily abusive. Maybe you have a friend who knows that you're an introvert, you're, you're in your shell, they want you they, they love you and they want you to grow with them. And that that's a tough call. Um, but once you ask that person to stop, that, then it should stop, right? Uh, if you ask someone to stop pushing a boundary and they keep pushing it, and it doesn't matter if that's a physical boundary, an emotional one, a verbal one, a sexual one, it does not matter. If you have said, this makes me uncomfortable, please stop doing it or just stop doing it. Uh, and they continue hammering on that boundary. Now you're getting into abuse. Uh, this is a really tough, tough area to navigate. Um, I think it's it's really important if you are uncertain, am I overthinking this? Uh, go with your gut. Your gut is really good most of the time. Uh, if you're still uncertain, engage outside counsel. And I, that that. That counsel does not have to be legal counsel. That counsel could be, again, a life coach, a therapist, a counselor, uh, a priest or preacher, um, someone that you trust, someone that you feel like has good objectivity, someone who perhaps knows how you think and run these scenarios by them and see what their call on this is. Because abuse in the workplace and in life is pretty rampant, unfortunately. Um, a lot of us come from very toxic or very traumatic or very abusive situations uh, as children, uh, both male, female, uh, gender binary, I'm sorry, non-binary. Uh, there are a lot of places that abuse is a problem. 
And we carry that problem with us, unfortunately. We carry those scars with us and we carry the, the behaviors that we learned from abusers and toxic people with us into the workplace and into the industry. I, I think a lot of the gatekeeping that you see is, is just a, a kind of a generic abusive, they want to control that space, right? Um, you need to be able to step back and ask for help to make sure that you're calling this right, that it's a, a pushing of a boundary versus abuse, but also perhaps to coach you through some of it. Uh, this slide has brought up a question that I thought was very interesting at the last time I, I gave this talk, and that's how do I tell a manager who's not a good manager from a manager who isn't the right manager for me, you know, from a manager who's just outright abusive. And that, again, very tough, very tough call sometimes. If there's ever any physical or sexual interaction, um, that's very clear. And if there is, don't go to HR. HR is there to protect the company. You need to file a police complaint and then go to HR. The verbal emotional is much more common and much harder to prove. That's where you need to take that step back, look to somebody that you trust, run those situations by them, and get that input, get that feedback on um, what you're seeing and what you're feeling. And in a lot of ways, it, it almost doesn't, I, I won't say it doesn't matter whether it's a manager who is not good for you versus a manager who's just not very good at managing versus a toxic manager, because the end result is that at some point you have to leave that manager. It's a question of how quickly do you need to get out. The more they are on that abusive side of the scale, the faster you need to be leaving. Um, it's it's very destructive to your mental health. And I would encourage you that if you're in a toxic workplace uh, and you you have a really good therapist on speed dial because it will make all the difference in the world. Uh, I hope that you're here if you are in a toxic uh, workplace. I hope that you're here, here and you come to the Career Village and you let us help you find a way out of that toxic place. Uh, if it's just a bad manager, maybe you can stay with that company and move around. And if it's a good manager who isn't the right manager for you, you have more opportunity to actually have a discussion with that person and say, this doesn't feel like it's working. I, I personally have literally said to a new manager in my 30 day review, I don't think I'll be here in 90 days because it's clear to me that I am not who you want to hire. I was able to have that conversation with him because in my judgment, he was a good person. He was just not the right manager for me. And I was correct that I was not the person he wanted to hire, but I was the right person for the role. And we managed to work that out. Uh, it's a judgment call on whether you can have that conversation with the manager. I hope that you can have that conversation with your manager if you feel like you're reporting to someone who isn't the right manager for you. If I feel like uh, somebody is reporting to me and I am not the right manager for them, I will find them the right manager. I will encourage them, especially if they're a good worker, I want them to stay with the company. I'm going to encourage them and find them that right place for them to be. Because if we take care of each other, even if we're not right for each other in a work situation or in a personal relationship, if we take care of each other, that's the number one thing we can do. So from that point of view, I want you to think about where you are now. Do you feel like you are on the right side of this image? Do you feel like you're on the left side of this image? Do you feel like you have a little more information perhaps to help you path your way across this to the right? Uh, I hope you do. I know I don't have a lot of time with you. We've got just a few seven minutes left. We could do a little Q&A. Uh, and if not, we can meet in the Career Village and I will be happy to answer any questions. If you are coming from a more traumatic uh, life experience, I would encourage you to get help. Uh, this industry is so hard on us. It's so hard on us from an emotional and from a psychological point of view. We are constantly fighting an uphill battle. Um, a lot of us are drawn to this industry because we've had some kind of traumatic event and we really believe in protecting other people. If you feel like you're going to hurt yourself, please get help. If you have been hurt, please get help. And if you are the person hurting someone else, 
please get help. You do not have to keep doing what you're doing. Um, yeah. Incredibly well said. I don't mean to interrupt. No, no, um, no. I'm at the end. <laughs> you, I have a few questions that right. I think are really interesting. Um, overwhelmingly positive response from the audience. A lot of people are saying, I wish she could come to our company and replace the training that we have because <laughs> this is powerful. Uh, also, they loved you talking about dick pics. I'm just kidding. <laughs> So I had, I had a couple of questions. Can there be consent between individuals in different layers of the same reporting structure? Like, can a senior on a team ever make a romantic play to junior and have real consent exist because of the <sighs> dynamic? That is a really great question. Uh, it is going to be exceedingly rare. I, I will never say no, it will never happen because then somebody is going to pop up with the edge case where it did happen to happen. Um, I would encourage you, if you are romantically interested in a subordinate, a subordinate, find them another role in your company so that they are not reporting to you <laughs> and then make your play. Uh, because I, I think it's absolutely correct. You are putting that person at risk and you're putting yourself at risk. Uh, the, your other option is go find another role. Um, I have absolutely started dating people that I was working with after I left the company. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, another question. What do you do when no just doesn't work with a colleague? There, there are situations where reporting this ends up making the reporting person be known as a victim or as the bad person for possibly unknowingly leading one on. That is so unfortunately common because like I said, HR is there to protect the company and not as much to protect you. Um, I have certainly heard of situations where someone has victimized several people at a large corporation I was, and still had their director title, uh, even after the Me Too movement. So that that is a real tough one. That's, I think, where you start engaging outside counsel, not necessarily legal, but definitely at some point legal. Um, start documenting religiously. Uh, mm -hmm. If it is a continual effort on that person's part and no is not an option, if there is a single HR person that you trust or a manager that you trust that can step in, um, I would certainly talk with them about it. Um, the problem, and, and this is a problem, especially that, that women and uh, minorities and, and lots of people face because when you complain, you become the problem, right? right. And that is a serious issue. And I've never worked at a company where that wasn't really an issue, to be honest. Um, I'm going to have to think on that one because, okay. and this is, and again, this is a, a problem because your usual best option is to leave. But that right. means that you're making a lateral movement and you're suffering, your career is suffering because this person won't leave you alone. I'm, I'm really glad you brought up that HR is there to protect the company mm -hmm. and not the employee. Mm -hmm. I think that's a hard lesson you have to learn at some points yes. in our industry and yeah. it's so counterintuitive. Okay. I think we have time for one final question and I think it's, uh, I think it sums up a lot of this quite well. How can we start getting our companies to start incorporating these key topics? Ooh, yeah. A com <laughs> corporations aren't good at honesty. I mean, let's be really truthful. Um, these are tough discussions to have. And uh, I'm going to have to think on that question. That's a, I haven't gotten that question. Well, we can I, have people check you out in the career village, yeah. right? Well, yeah, let's do a panel on that in the career village uh, later today, because I think there are ways to do it. I just, uh, usually I'm the person that's advocating that level of honesty. Um, but I, I don't know how to formalize that yet. Great. Well, thank you so much for your talk. It was amazing. Everyone in the, the chat loved it. If you want to talk to Carlotta more, please find them in the uh, Career Village here today all day. So thank you so much. And uh, you. Yeah, we'll be looking forward to the next speaker coming up here in just a couple minutes. Fantastic.